storm, huh? Today's the Lord's Day. We come to His house. I'm glad that you're here. And uh, we will not have service tonight. We were supposed to resume tonight, uh, but they're saying the worst of the winds and maybe the weather will come in later today. And so out of precaution, we will not meet tonight, but we'll meet, uh, of course, today at 9 and 11. I'm glad that you're here. I do want to mention that some of our adult Sunday school classes are meeting today. And so you should have been notified by your teacher for that. I think adult one, two, and three are supposed to meet uh, between early service and late service. So please uh, make note of that. Uh, do you want to uh, also highlight this? Um, some of you have already noticed. You no longer have to sit three feet from the aisle. That was changed with phase two. And so I uh, see that you're abiding by that. So we pulled the little tape off. So you go ahead and you can hug the aisle. But be cautious about hugging people, though. You see, that's, that's still the deal. We got, we got any huggers out there? All right. If you want to hug and you want to mug, you go right ahead. We'll give you permission. I do want to mention a few other things in terms of uh, our schedule. Wednesday night, we will be continuing our Wednesday night schedule. We had a really good crowd. I thought this past Wednesday prayer meeting was back to about normal numbers immediately. And our youth and children were meeting, so keep that in mind. Our WMU will be resuming their meetings after several months of not meeting. That will be on Tuesday, June the 23rd. And if you need more information, ladies, you can get in touch with uh, Marie Landry. And, of course, we continue to reach uh, out with our youth renovations. are getting close to the $30,000 mark, so we're almost a third of the way there. So please continue to be diligent in your giving uh, related to that. So I just want to welcome you to God's house today. The storm should not be a big deal, it appears. So we're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. The Word of God tells us to do it that way. That's what Jesus said. True worship is worship in spirit and in truth. So let's pray. And then I want to ask Tyler to lead us in worship. Bobby and Janet's out of town this weekend. And so he and the band will be leading our worship. So you follow him as he takes us to the throne of grace. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we do thank you in the name of Jesus that we get to be in the house of the Lord. God, it's a blessing to be here. And God, yes, the storm is coming, but God, uh, we're familiar with storms, not only the weather kind, but other kinds. And uh, today, may we know you, know you in this place. For God, uh, you're here. You're here, whether it's sunshiny or cloudy or windy. Uh, Father, you're here in the middle of viruses. You're here in the middle of social unrest. You're here all the time. God, you haven't changed, even though our world is ever changing. Help us not to be afraid, Father, in the middle of a, a time that is uncertain. For God, we find peace in this place. God, coming here matters. I know for me it matters. God, it matters to come to a place that represents the, the presence of God. And so, Lord, today may we know you, know you completely. Let us feel you now as we worship and as we hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Join me as we sing.
There is no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee. Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Out of Zion's hill, salvation Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power.
gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you,
Appreciate Tyler leading us today, don't you? Thank you so much, Tyler. Is somebody's car alarm, is that somebody's car? Check your car out. Everybody's checking their little machines there and pressing their buttons. We're in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 today, uh, verses 1 through 13. Let's honor the reading of God's Word as we stand together.
For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you that you help us stand up under the times in which we live. For Lord, these are certainly days that need endurance. They need enduring Christians, enduring men and women of God who can say, I will go on. I will not hide. I will not fear. I will not run. And I pray we'll be a people here at Bayou Vista Baptist Church, God, that give an example to others to endure. Uh, today, help us, Lord. I do pray for the storm that's uh, out in the Gulf. God, it appears not to be uh, very menacing, uh, menacing before us, but uh, God, I pray that it will not do much harm to anyone. And thank you that you've been gracious to us. Uh, but God, today, let us be challenged here in this room. Let people be challenged as they watch on, on TV and, Father, perhaps on their phones and, and listen that they will hear a message that helps them to press on. In Jesus' name, amen. As many of you know, uh, yesterday would have been Elijah's second birthday. And uh, obviously when you come to those milestones in life, you think about them quite a bit. And so for me, in my mind, I'm thinking yesterday about a, a birthday party. I'm thinking about a two-year-old making an incredible mess with cake and ice cream and all that would have gone with that. And so for me, it, it was a day of, of thinking of what could have been and uh, we hoped would have been. But instead, we actually visited the cemetery, and uh, Tim and Lee changed the flowers out there, and, and so we got to remember him there. But let me just say this, not to uh, make you sad, but to let you know this. As I look back uh, from two years ago and all that transpired during the two and a half months he was with us, I learned something that I would never have learned had it not been for that season of life. I learned more about endurance by enduring than I would have learned had it not occurred. Endurance, faith, happens only when you go through dark seasons of life. And so when it comes to the whole idea of enduring, I want you to think about the bigger picture uh, of your life and the season we find ourselves in as a nation, uh, even with the storm that's coming in uh, probably overnight. Uh, the last 10 years have been quite challenging for us, have they not? I look back, and April 20th of 2010 was the Deepwater Horizon tragedy out in the Gulf. I think we all remember that. A number of men were killed. The rig caught on fire, spilled oil for many, many days. And do you know this, though? Even with that, the price of oil stayed over $100 a barrel until about 2014. I looked at the charts, and, uh, you know, that was back in 2010, but the oil went up and down, and then 2014, it started to tank, and then you might remember just a few weeks back, we actually saw oil prices that were under zero for a little bit with futures, and, and now it's coming back some. But ever since then, we have been challenged in our part of the world for six years about the future of the economy. And of course, we just go back a couple of months. In March 2020, the whole coronavirus thing hits us, and it changes people's perspective, their future, their, what they looked at in terms of 
of what was going to happen immediately. But good report this week is we got over 2 million jobs came back in the last month, which is hopeful uh, that we'll see continued rebound as, as we move forward. And then what, in the last two weeks, we've had major civil unrest in America. I'm sure you've been watching television about the major cities and all the damage that has been done. And then on top of that, we have a tropical storm that comes in the Gulf. And you're thinking, what else are we going to get uh, before it's over with? But can I tell you this? Oil has always been uncertain. Sicknesses have come and they've gone and they have always uh, been uncertain. The civil unrest that we're having today, we've had it for years. We've had it for, for generations, have we not? I mean, it's always happened like that. And then storms, folks, we're only one week into hurricane season. Buckle your seatbelts. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I think we've broken a record for three named storms this early in the season. You got to hang on. Say that with me. Hang on. You got to hang on. Enduring is all about hanging on. But Brother Steve, I'm tired of hanging on. It seems like there's always something. You only have two choices in life. You can hang on or you can let go. And the call of the Christian is to do what? It's to hang on. It's to endure. In a life of constant changes, we can hang on or we can let go. And I have found scripturally that the people that made a difference for God, they always hung on. You don't find anybody that made a great impact for God's kingdom that let go. They always hung on. And so I want to speak about that today, a call to endure. And no matter what comes our way, be it natural like a tropical storm, be it you know, something in terms of viruses or illnesses, be it the economy, there's going to be challenges that hit us every year, sometimes every month. Sometimes every week. You ever made this statement? I'm sure you have. It seems like it's always something. And it is always going to be something. So folks, before you go to heaven, where there's nothing to worry about, understand that in this life we're going to have to hang on and we're going to have to endure. Let's look at a few things about enduring today. First thing I want you to grab out of our text is we need to learn from those who have failed to endure. We've got all kind of people we can learn from that are fa people that failed to hang in there. Do you know in Dallas, Texas, that there is a place called the Quitters Hall of Fame? Did you know that? The Quitters Hall of Fame. It, it is a collection of all the people over the years that quit, and, and there's monuments to them. Do you know that? Well, actually, that didn't happen. Before they finished, they quit. But I mean, I just wanted to think about that. There would never be a place called the Quitters Hall of Fame. Because quitters do not make an impact, do they? The people that quit church make an impact for God? Not really. The people that quit school often make an impact. Well, some turn around and they pick up their bootstraps and they go on. But generally, the people that endure are the people that make a difference. Quitters are everywhere. But generally, those who quit do not change their world. You know, I want to discourage you from quitting, but I want us to look at those who did quit. Now, in our passage today, most of it is a lengthy list of times when the people of God quit. I heard a guy say years ago, you don't live long enough to only learn from your mistakes, so learn from the mistakes of others. And we're going to notice in verses uh, the, the very first uh, 10 verses or so about the mistakes of the people of God, uh, primarily in the Old Testament. So let's look at that. Verse 1. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the same cl the, the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. And so he's saying, let's look back in history. The people of God, as God freed them from Egypt, they all experienced the ten plagues. They all experienced the manna. They all experienced the Red Sea. They all experienced the water from the rock. They all experienced the quail. They saw the blessings of God. But even though they saw all this, 
we'll see in a minute, many of them became quitters. Many of them walked away from God. Many of them verbally doubted. Many of them became complainers. Something we need to grab onto, and I hope you do this regularly. Verses 1 through 4 say, Before these people became quitters and doubters and complainers, they experienced the blessings of God. Do you recount your blessings? I try to do this on a regular basis, especially when I get discouraged. I thank God for the multitude of things that he's given me. If ever you get down in the dumps, what you need to do is say, God, thank you, and then just start listing off the things that he's given you. I thank God for my mom and dad. I do that on a regular basis. I thank God that I met Tammy Lee 34 years ago, and we've been married all these years and had these children. I thank God for the ministry. I thank God for America. I thank God for my relatively good health. When you get down in the dumps and you start saying, God, this is wrong and that's wrong and this is wrong, why don't you say, God, this is right and this is right and this is right? If you're not careful, you choose what's wrong in life rather than what's right in life. And let me tell you, quitters focus on the bad things. Endurers focus on the good things. People that hang in there are not the ones that are always down in the dumps. It's the ones that say, God, I may be in trouble now, but I've been blessed before and I will be blessed again. Endurance is painful. Giving up takes almost no effort. People complain a lot in Scripture. You think about it. You follow Moses' crew and they're going out of Egypt. What's one of the first things they complain about? The food. The food's not good. You know, I bet there's some of you that said, I sure wish this coronavirus thing would end. I'm tired of eating at home. I want to get back out and I want to eat this food. I want to get my seafood. I want to get Mexican. I want to go to crawfish boil. Boy, I'm tired of this coronavirus keeping me at home. And then some people complain there about water. We're thirsty, Moses. We want water. And they're complaining about food and they're complaining about water. And then they say, you know, when we were back in Egypt, we had all kinds of vegetables to eat. We're tired of this manna. And so they complained and they complained. Let me tell you, people that make no impact for the kingdom of God are always complaining. We got any chronic complainers in the room? Look at verse 5. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Not all of them, but most of them. And their bodies were scattered over the desert. Why was he not pleased? Well, 40 years in the desert, they're scattered all over. Because when the, the spies went in to check out the land of promise, 10 of them came back with a bad report, and 2 of them came back with a good report. And the majority of the nation said, we can't take this over. And they were discouraged. And that's why... They were scattered. He was not pleased with most of them because most of them were ungrateful complainers. The church of God should be a people who are happy with what they have. Are you happy with what you have? Have you learned to be content in all things? You know, Paul says in uh, Philippians chapter 4, I've learned the secret of being content in all circumstances, whether well-fed or, or whether hungry. He said, I've learned the secret. To learn the secret of contentment. He says later on in, I think, 1 Timothy 6, he said that uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. We got content people of God. Uh, God was not pleased with them. Look at verse 7. Uh, Do not be idolaters as some of them were. Not all of them, but some of them turned to idolatry. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. They quit God. Oh, they were all for God when he was killing the Egyptians and when he was uh, making it dark and raining down hail from heaven, when he was killing the animals of Egypt. Yeah, they liked that. When the water turned to blood, they're cheering on God. But when they got out, God freed them and he gave them what they wanted. They weren't happy. And so they turn to idolatry. I, I think what happens a lot of times, God gives you what you want and you get bored with it. You get your freedom, God makes you bored. God, I've been working my whole life, and now I'm ready to retire. You retire, I'm, God, I'm, that's not what I thought it would be. God, I thought I'd get this new job, and it's not what I thought it would be. God, I got this new husband, I got this new wife, it's not what I thought it would be. God, I'm bored. We see here, that's what happened with them. They became idolaters when they got the very thing that they wanted, and they indulged in pagan revelry. Look at verse 8. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. 
And in one day, 23,000 of them died. If you read the back story, I think it's back in Numbers, uh, they were starting to worship the Baal of Peor, as it's called, and they engaged in sexual immorality, which was part of the pagan practice of religious worship under Baal. And so as they're going along the journey away from the land of Egypt, moving toward God's eventual land of promise, they gradually got away from God. If you're not careful, as you go through the journey of what you used to be to where God wants you to be, you'll get bored, you'll get distracted, you'll get disillusioned, you'll be attracted to other things, and the temptation is there not to endure. However, although you might say, I've never given up on God, perhaps you've given in to sin. This always happens with Christians over the course of life. We will always have an opportunity to get off the path of endurance and go down the path of sin. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. Are you part of the some of them? I mentioned to you last week uh, about how we've done quite well, you know, post-virus back in worship. This is what, our fourth week, I believe. I was on a conference call again this week with our state leadership, and uh, we're still seeing statewide about a 30 to 35, 40 percent attendance statewide compared to before the virus. Now, today we're a little down because of the, the storm, and I get that, but we've done well. But I wonder, I, I wonder, think, listen, folks, could this virus get people off the path? Could not being in church for 10 weeks be enough to get people off the path? I mean, we're not talking about war. <laughs> we're, we're not talking about a natural disaster that's destroyed large areas of the country. We're talking about a quarantine that's kept people out of church. Would that be enough? Let's endure, stay on the path. Look at verse 9. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by stakes. Do you, do you notice this all throughout the passage? Some people went one direction, some went another. We got people that are uh, getting distracted by various things, and that's true for all of us. Some of us don't endure for this reason, and some stop enduring for other reasons. We all have our weaknesses, and we see in this case that they were tempting God again. They were questioning Moses, and God had enough. And what does he do? He sends the snakes in the camp. We preached on that a number of weeks ago. And they, they set up the bronze snake on the pole, and that would be a, a, really a picture, a symbol of future redemption in Jesus as you look at the cross. But God said, I'm so tired of you people not staying with me. And so what does God do when we get off the path? Sometimes he sends us snakes to get us back on the path. And it says they tested the Lord. Look at verse 10. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. He's given a history lesson of the journey through the wilderness. And you might remember three names, Korah and Dathan and Abiram. Remember these guys? Uh, they questioned Moses, and they questioned Aaron and their leadership, and they wanted to kind of take control, and, and so there's a quarrel in the camp, and the people are not really sure where to go. And if you remember what happens there, that's when God says, okay, get everybody away from Korah and Datham and Abiram. Remember that? And what happens to them? They're sucked into the ground. Folks, that would cause me to want to endure, because I don't want to be the next guy sucked into the ground. But look at the picture of the Israelites. God comes to their aid, and some of them did this, and some of them did this. Some of them went to idols, and some of them went to complaining, and, and others are just discontented, and they don't want to follow Moses. Inconsistency throughout the camp. Inconsistently, inconsistency will always lead you to lack endurance. How has your relationship with God been since the middle of March? I, I wish I could hand out some paper and say, okay, let's, let's write a, a little essay. Since the middle of March, I have seen my relationship with God blank. I'm talking about write, write paragraphs. How has my Bible study been since the middle of March? How has my prayer life been since the middle of March? 
How has my faith been since the middle of March? How's my language been since the middle of March? What would, what would you write down? Would you say, you know what, Brother, if I'm honest about it, I, I, you know, I've shown up for church the last several weeks, but I don't like what's happened to me since the middle of March. Or maybe some would say, Brother Steve, it's one of the best things that ever happened in my life. I have refocused my attention on the important things of God since all this stuff has happened nationally and has changed my behavior and my pattern and my schedule. What about you? What would you say? Because remember, what's being said here in 1 Corinthians 10 is this is over time. He's saying over time, people messed up in different things. What about you? Have you kept your heart right with God? Here's what I find with a lot of Christians. They're, they're fair weather believers. You know, they're only happy when it's sun shining outside. And it's 73 degrees with 40% humidity. And their job's stress-free. And their kids listen. And their car starts. And the dishwasher doesn't leave spots on the glasses. And the dog doesn't wet the carpet. And everyone treats them nicely. Listen, if you have to have an ideal world to serve God, you're out of luck. If that's the way it's got to be for you to endure, you need to get on another planet. We need tough believers who can make it through when life is cloudy, like it is outside, and it's 92 degrees, and the humidity is 90%, and the kids won't listen to anything, and the car won't start, and the dishwasher is leaking on the floor, and the dog is biting your foot. You know, you hear what I'm saying? Can you endure when life is like that? Let's not be a bunch of fair weather Christians. If you cannot endure during difficulties, then you're a spoiled, pampered brat. Now, I know I'm talking to older people generally in this first service, and uh, some of our young folks are here, but listen, we, one thing about getting old, you've got to endure, you're going to die, right? How many aches and pains have you had in 70 years of life, for those of you in that age group? You've had a few, haven't you? A few hospitalizations, some surgeries? Lost some jobs, had some disappointments, didn't get promotions, had some issues with your kids or your grandkids. You know what I'm talking about? That's one thing about living longer in life. You, you have to endure or you're not going to make it. And I, I think about our 20-year-olds and teenagers, and maybe our 30-year-olds. Listen, you, you're going to have to hurt a lot. Just get ready for it. Amen? Tyler, life's not going to be easy, son. It's just not. Ask your daddy, right, daddy? That's just the way it is. And we've got to be tough. We need tough Christians, don't we? I get tired of these mamby-bamby Christians. You hear what I'm hearing? Mamby-bamby. It's, it's, it's hot in the building. Service goes too long. I want this and I want this. You don't always get what you want. I beg your pardon, ma'am. I didn't promise you a rose garden. Amen. You know what I'm talking about. That's just the way that it is. I do want to commend our, our young people. We had several up here today leading in worship. They're not the rule. They're the exception. You guys hang in there. We need you in the long run. Let's look at the second thing. You need to prepare yourself for endurance. You need to learn from the quitters of the past that didn't endure, but prepare yourself for endurance. When I was a little boy, for some reason, my mom and dad decided to buy me an above-the-ground pool. I had a four foot, it was only 15 feet wide above the ground pool in the backyard. I was the first one in the neighborhood to get an above the ground pool. My friends down the street started liking me even more when I had the above the ground pool. They'd come over and we'd swim. Let me tell you what we used to do, and this was kind of a neat deal. We played this game, uh, it, it was the hold your breath game. You, you probably played that over the years in a pool. And the, the hold your breath game is see how many laps you can make it across the pool and back in one breath. You ever play that game, the hold your breath game? Well, we played that game, and uh, I had two or three buddies that came over and swam all the time. And so what we would do is take a deep breath, and you kick, and you get across, and you got to flip, and you come back, and just see how many laps you can make. And here's what I found about playing that game. The longer we played that game, the more laps I was able to take on a single breath. You see, because when I, when I wasn't working at it, I, I lost my breath quicker. And so we'd make a lap or a couple laps and 
and I'm coming up and I'm gasping, but as I worked at it more and more, I found that my endurance level and my understanding that I could make another lap increased. In fact, I probably could have made that other lap earlier. It was just in my mind that I couldn't. Is that true for you? You possibly quit before you need to because your mind tells you you can't make another lap. So often true in life. Endurance prepares you for more endurance. But I also see this. I have less endurance the less opportunities I've had to need to endure. I think about our trips to Haiti. I mentioned going to Haiti last week. And uh, we went on two trips. Uh, the second trip in particular, Roger and Billy Joe were there for this one. And we built pews in the tent city there. Uh, I can't remember. Caridou was the name of the place. And so we... Uh, we had one of the local Haitians built a pew for us, and then we back-engineered it and cut it all out and got all the pieces together, and then we went in and built the pews. And so we're in this tent, and we're building these pews, and we got in three teams, and we had a bunch of Haitians helping us. And folks, this is July in Haiti. Okay, I'm there. I think I'm wearing shorts, and I'm wearing a T-shirt. We got all these Haitians are wearing long pants. I am sweating profusely. My entire shirt is full of liquid. My pants are dripping. I look at all these Haitian guys building pews. Do you know what? They're not sweating a bit. None of them are sweating a bit. Rod, you even sweat, didn't you? I mean, we're, I'm, looking, I'm thinking, how can you guys not sweat? It is 90 degrees. We're inside a tent. And you guys are not sweating. I didn't say that because I didn't want to look dumb. But I'm thinking, why aren't you sweating? And they're thinking, fat Americans sweating. That's what they're thinking. Yeah. But these guys, they lived in it how often? Every day of their lives. I'm a pampered air-conditioned boy. And these people are living this every day. Listen, endurance is a result of experience. And if you say, God, I don't like, life's got me sweating. God says, you know what? It's good for you to sweat. Get some of those impurities out of you. You'll start sweating a little bit. Pampered living leads to short endurance. But struggle is actually good for the long run. Look at verse 12. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So he transitions from looking at the history of the Israelite people as they're transferring from Egypt to the land of promise. And he's saying, they failed, they failed, they failed, they failed. Some failed here, some failed there, but they failed across the board for the majority of the people. And so think about your own life. If you're not careful, you will fail to stand firm. Be careful you don't fall. A number of years ago, I had a guy in a church I pastored in another part of the state, and we had revival meeting. It was a great revival. In fact, God did a work in his life, and this guy... Um, came to me and said, Brother Steve, I, I want to give my testimony as a result of this revival, what God's done in my life, and I want to share with the church uh, the change that he's made in me. And I said, man, listen, your life's been very sporadic over the years, and I believe God worked in your life, but if you get up and give this life-changing testimony and you don't stick with it, people are going to frown on you later that you were a hypocrite. He said, I want to share it. And if you don't let me share it, I'm going to go down the road to another sister church and I'm going to have them let me share it. But I want to share my testimony. I said, then you better live up to it. You better live up to the testimony you're going to give in front of the church. Otherwise, people are going to say, yeah, that's what we thought was going to happen. Because he had been a guy who was hot and cold and hot and cold. So I let him get up and he gave his testimony. He did a good job. Fast forward two months. Guess what happened? He had gotten away again. And I'm sad to report about a couple years ago, I got word that he had gotten a tough time in life and took his life. Took his life early. Somebody who had a lot going for him. And his testimony today would be a guy who did not endure. A man who would not endure. Endurance is not easy. It takes a lifetime to build up an enduring heart. Think about your life. Uh, do you see any way today that you would turn on God and walk the other direction? Do you see any way that would happen? I'll say this. I don't say this arrogantly. I just say this because I don't know another way. Amen? 
I've lived so long serving God and being in His house and being in His Word. I've not always been happy with the way it's turned out, but I don't know of another way. And that's really the goal of the Christian. God, I know you and I trust you. I see no other way to go. It's like Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Endurance is a necessity to serving God. You got to prepare yourself to endure. Uh, look what it says in uh, verse 15 of 2 Timothy 2. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. That's why we read the one-year Bible. For the hope of enduring. That the word of God gets into you. I don't know about you, but as I read the Bible daily, sometimes a passage, a verse, a book, a part of scripture will come to me that I need to depend upon. You see, you study to show yourself approved because one day you're going to have to put it to work. A workman who does not need to be ashamed and who can handle the word of truth in the times in life when you most need to endure. Let us be faithful. You know, I look at all the civil unrest we've had in our country and I don't want to get into it because there's so much to it. But I do know this. If I had the word of God in me, and it lives in me, it would determine how I handle this. Would it not? It would determine whether I turn to violence or I turn to peace. It would determine what I say and what I refrain from saying. It would determine how I love people or how I fail to love people. The Word of God internalized makes me presentable to God as one who is approved. Prepare yourself to endure. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Uh, I love Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. It, it talks about the running the race with Jesus at the finish line. But, but it, it says primarily here, you've got to get rid of the things that stop you from running. The sins that weigh us down. So we focus on the Word of God preparing to endure, and we get rid of sins. Because listen, sin will cause you to quit. Sin turns faithful people into quitters. But Steve, I'm 75 years old. And sin does not appeal to me anymore. Sin's too much effort. You ever thought about that? Too much effort to sin. It takes a lot of trouble. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. I'm past that. Well, let me tell you this. One of the greatest sins you'll have in your life is the sin of the mind. It's the sin of the attitude. It's the sin of uh, the heart. It's the sin of rebellion. It's the sin of bitterness. Let's throw off everything that hindered, hinders and the sin that so easily entangles so that we can run with perseverance, endurance, the race that is marked out for us. Look at the last thing. Trust God to give you the ability to endure. You prepare to endure and ask God to give you the ability uh, to endure. A few years ago, I remember Sarah sharing with me that she had a classmate that she went to school with who overreacted to not making a hundred on a test. Is it okay not to make a hundred on a test? You know, if they got a 97, they were, they were really upset. And if they got a 93, you thought the world had come to an end. And I, I told Sarah this when she would share this with me. Here's what I said. Sarah, that really concerns me. How are they going to deal with life when it doesn't turn out the way they want it to? You don't have to make 100 on everything. You don't have to make a 95 on everything. By the way, you don't have to make an A. Is it okay not to make an A? Poster child for that right there. I mean, you know, it, it's okay not to make an A. Life is not always going to be an A, is it? But let's see, if it didn't work out the way I wanted, can I tell you, it's not always going to work out the way you want it to. People are going to get sick. You ever knew somebody that every time they got sick, you thought they were dying? Let's see, you're talking about my husband now. He, he gets sick and 
He just gets in the bed. You, you would think he was about to leave us. You think we needed to call the, the mortuary to come pick up the body. He's, you know, when he gets sick, the world ends. You ever saw somebody when what they had planned is canceled, they go, oh, I just can't believe it. I've been just waiting for this. I planned this vacation. I wanted to go here, and it's not working out the way I want. Listen, life doesn't work out the way you want it to work out. Church, get used to it. I, I think the fact that people can't endure through disappointment says a whole lot about their mindset of being pampered and blowing things out of proportion. Let's be a tough people of God. It's a call to endure. Yes, it's difficult, but when you endure, it helps you get over the next bump in the road. Let's look at the key verse in our passage today, verse 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Very key statement. Every temptation, every problem, every obstacle is common to man. Is this tropical storm common? Yeah, it's common. Happens every year. You're going to have tropical storms every June through November, right? We call it hurricane season. Get used to it. Are we going to have the flu every year? We've had it for years. It's going to, I make a prediction. We're going to have the flu this coming fall again. Is coronavirus new? Nope. It's been, been around in other forms. It's kind of, they call it the novel coronavirus because it's new this time. But there, there's always something. You got Ebola and you got SARS and you got the, the West Nile virus and you might get bit by a mosquito and get something. Folks, there's always going to be something and it's common to man. God, why'd you let this happen? Because you live in a sinful world and that is common to man. But look at the statement, God is faithful. Temptations are normal, but God is what? Faithful. Temptations are common, but God is faithful. Enduring people understand that. It's going to be problematic for a time, but God is faithful. Let's even go this far. Can God be faithful to you through temptation and the end result is death? Because you're going to die. But Brother Steve, I thought God comes to my rescue. He does. It's called eternal life. Amen. One day, the temptation you don't like is going to kill you. One day, the problem, the sickness, the storm, the issue of life that you don't like is going to kill you. And you know what's going to happen? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are what? With me. Your rod and your staff do what? They comfort me. And so we hold on to God. God, I will endure when you're with me and keep me here. And God, I will hold on to you when you take me home. It even says there that he will provide a way out when you're tempted. Sometimes the way out's death. And that's not a terrible thing. See, I don't want to die. Sorry. Sorry. We have a 100% chance of dying if Jesus doesn't return. So we prepare, we endure, we keep going. In James chapter 1, this is Tamalee's favorite passage. James 1, 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Consider it joy whenever you face trials. It doesn't say if, whenever, because you will, and you know that that's going to create the testing of your faith, which will develop perseverance and will make you mature and complete. We got any graduates out here from the School of Hard Knocks? But see, I got my doctorate from the School of Hard Knocks. I got my bachelor's, my master's, and my doctorate from the School of Hard Knocks. You want to look at my arm? I got a scar here, and I got a scar here. I got one here. I got one here. I got one under my knee. We got anybody with scars? That's one thing about old folks. They like to sit together and talk about their surgeries. Amen? I got through double bypass. 
I had quadruple bypass. What you talking about, bud? And, you know, people like to get together. Isn't that a good thing? Well, the good thing is you can still talk about it. Man, I had a stroke. Three of them. I had the left knee replaced, two knees, and a shoulder. If Roy would be here today, he could tell you about all his surgeries. I mean, he's had a bunch of them. And I, I just like his attitude. I, I, I don't care. Give me another one. Give me another surgery. Church, we endure through it all. Perseverance makes you mature and complete, not lacking anything. Listen to me. If you don't endure, the devil laughs at you. But you know what happens when you endure? You can laugh at the devil. Your lack of endurance lets the devil laugh at you. You wimpy little Christian. You say that you know him, but you can't stand the test, can you? But you know what's really good is when you stand the test, you can say, Devil, it doesn't matter what you bring on. I've read the end of the book. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I love what it says in uh, Revelation, I think it's chapter 21, that he will make all things new. There'll be no more death or sorrow or pain. For the old order of things, folks, it's passing away. So let's endure because the day is going to come where we transition from the old order to the new order. In closing, let me say a few things. All prices will be volatile the rest of your life. Trust Jesus. Illnesses will present themselves. There'll be something new next year. Trust Jesus. Man will be upon man. Man will destroy man's stuff. Man will be upset and angry for the rest of your life. Trust Jesus. And by the way, we will have some more hurricane watches this year. So trust Jesus. Folks, it's not going to change in your lifetime. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Endure. Say this with me. Hang on. Say it again. Hang on. One more time. Hang on. Church, let's hang on. Don't give up. Don't give in. And don't give out. Endure. The scripture is very clear. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. Endure. Hang in there. And we get through all this stuff. More is coming. Hang in there. He said, in this world you will have trouble. But I have done what? I've overcome the world. Let's stand together. Invitation.